Hi Drew, it's the 28th of August 2012. You're coming to the end of the August challenge, but I've just realised you haven't uploaded a video on math. There are several things I would like to upload about mathematics. From its origins, to its philosophy, to why I want to study it. But alas, I have chosen none of those things. Instead, I shall talk about one of the great 20th century mathematicians, G. H. Hardy. Now, Adrito Hardy was no Einstein, but that's not why he's interesting. Of course, he was a phenomenal mathematician. With the help from his colleague Littlewood and his disciple Ramanujan, he progressed number theory and mathematical analysis sevenfold. Ramanujan, if you remember, is what you got your Kelvin Science Award for. Link in the description. He's interesting, well, to me at least, because of this book, A Mathematician's Apology. This book outlines the principle of mathematics that he followed, and has influenced my mathematic philosophy greatly. So far I've read it twice and I'm beginning to understand his deeper statements. Some of which I do not agree with, but he wrote this book in 1940 and times have changed since then. But first we must understand him as a person. To put it in his words, anyone who defends his subject will find that he is defending himself. The same goes in reverse. We must first understand the person before we understand his teaching. Hardy was born on February 7th, 1877. He was talented from a young age and in 1896 he entered Trinity College, Cambridge. Though he aced the tripods, he hated the system, feeling it was an end rather than a means to an end. He became a fellow in the turn of the century and in 1906 became a lecturer. In 1919, he became a civilian chair of geometry in Oxford, though returned to Cambridge in 1942, dying on December 1st, 1947, aged 70. As we can see, he was a great mathematician, reaching the utmost highest things that he could have done academically. His death signified the end of traditional mathematics, with the computer being developed. And because of that, he has a very conservative view of mathematics and the world itself, or at least a more elitist view of the world, which I believe is justified because mathematics is the queen of science, and how boring would the world be without science? Hardy sets out to solve two problems in his apology. One, whether the work someone does is worth doing, and two, why he does it. Hardy says that people only do something because it's the one and only thing that I can do well. I agree that it might be better to be a poet or mathematician, but unfortunately I have no talents for such pursuits. He goes on to saying that he is not suggesting that this is defence that can be made by most people, since most people can do nothing at all well, which I find hilariously true. Most people are average. That's the definition of average. Well, at least the definition of most. Most people do things because they have no clue what else to do. And yes, occasionally they may succeed, but most don't. Hardy continues, if a man has any genuine talent, he should be ready to make almost any sacrifice in order to cultivate it to the full. This also makes perfect sense, but not something that I follow. I do not sacrifice all my time and effort to study mathematics. This vlog, for example. But maybe it's because I don't have that genuine talent. Maybe I don't spend the time on mathematics because I think it's pointless. The things that I learn and discover will be outclassed by thousands of other people. So why try? That's a pretty easy question to answer, Adrita. If you don't try, how will you ever succeed? Then, for example, you solve the Riemann hypothesis. All that time would have been well spent. You would become immortal. What is the chance that I will solve something so magnificent? Would you rather live a relaxed life with a small chance of success? Or a stressed one with a slightly greater chance of success? I know which one Hardy would choose. If a man is any sense a real mathematician, then it's a hundred to one that his mathematics will be far better than anything else he can do, and that he would be silly if he surrendered any decent opportunity of exercising his one talent in order to do undistinguished work in other fields. Such a sacrifice could be justified only by economic necessity or age. He says there are three fundamental reasons for doing something. Curiosity, rational pride, and ambition. He goes on to say, if a mathematician, chemist, or even a psychologist were to tell me that the driving force in his work being the desire to benefit humanity, I should not believe him. Though harsh, I believe it to be true. True. I see several of my fears wanting to study medicine, but how many of them would have studied if it was poorly paid, had bad job security, and not seen high in society? I would guess very little. However, if the same things were to occur to a mathematician, I reckon a much higher proportion would stay. If I had a statue on a column in London, would I prefer the columns to be so high that the statue was invisible, or low enough for the features to be recognisable? I would choose the first alternative, Dr Snow, presumably the second.